So it was on uh, Palm Sunday, the family was getting ready to go to church, and uh, little Joey, the son, got really sick, but both mom and dad had a part in the service, so what could they do? They quick got on the phone, they dialed and got a babysitter, and the babysitter came over, they went to church, and of course, uh, they didn't dilly-dally around afterward, they came home, and, and they had their palms, and little Joey said, what's that for? He said, well, you know, they waved him when Jesus went by, and some threw him in the road before him when he went by, and little Joey said, go figure. The one Sunday I am not there, he shows up. <laughs> it is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. I call this, I'm not exactly sure what's happening here, because in John chapter 12, verse 16, they weren't exactly sure what was going down on Palm Sunday. And maybe somebody here is not quite sure what's going down on Palm Sunday. Maybe uh, you've had a surprise birthday party. Ever had that? Okay, nobody ever threw a surprise birthday party for you poor people. Well, you poor people. Where it was really a big surprise. I mean, you were totally surprised. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe you walked into a restaurant and everybody else, surprise! And you're like, whoa. You know, you had that gaze in your eyes like the deer staring in the headlights, you know, and it was like, duh, what, what's happening here? Uh, How'd they know it was my birthday kind of thing? Well, I think for the disciples, it's kind of like that. They're, they don't know what is going on here. Or maybe for some of you that nobody ever threw a surprise birthday party for you, it's like you were really in a deep sleep. And I'm not talking about Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> All right, but you've been in a deep sleep. And somebody comes and they wake you up and you're so groggy, you say, what day of the week is it? Ever been there? Just raise your hand or raise your palm. Yeah, yeah, you've been there. You've experienced that. It's like, I'm not exactly sure what's happening here. And I think we have that thing going on here in our passage today. I'm only going to speak from one verse, and I'm going to take it apart phrase by phrase as we go. It says in John chapter 12, verse 16, about the Palm Sunday, the original one. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. I want to start out the very first thing. It says, at first. At first it was on Palm Sunday. They should have known and seen this coming. It's kind of like your surprise birthday party, right? You know your birthday is coming. And it should not surprise you because it is your birthday, right? That's the way, that's just the way it works. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Now, I want to focus for a moment on the people here. His disciples. Five of them were fishermen. Peter, James, John, Andrew, and Philip, okay? They're just common, everyday, ordinary folk. They get up, they go do their job, they come home, nothing special, nothing extraordinary out of them. They're common, like you and me, right? Well, then there's one guy in there, he might have been royalty. Well, at least he's got some no noble blood in him. And his name is Bartholomew. A and Bart was saved by an M, the letter M. You say, what are you talking about, saved by an M? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it tells us, that not many noble are saved or called. Not many. If you take that M off of there, it says not any noble are called, but he was called. He's the only one in the group that's noble because there was an M on there. You see, God does not exclude anyone, even the noble person. So he's the only one that's got a little nobility in him other than the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And so we got five fishermen, uh, we've got one kind of noble guy, and, and then there's a guy that is totally despised by everybody, Matthew. Most of us don't want to identify with Matthew, right? Because he's the guy that nobody likes. And maybe you're here and you're saying, yep, that's me. Nobody likes me. He's viewed kind of as a traitor, right? He's a traitor. He's Jewish. But rather than stick up for the Jewish nation, Israel, he sold out. He's a tax collector for the Romans, for the Romans. So they all despise him, and so he's kind of a despised kind of guy in the crowd. 
And, and then that's followed up by a guy by the name of Simon the Zealot. The very name Zealot tells you something about him. He's the kind of guy that is a political activist. You might call him a right-wing extremist. He is a nationalist. He's all Israel, okay? He believes that story of David, little David, defeating the giant Goliath, all right? With a little stone, and so he believes that himself with his group of zealots, they can overthrow the Roman Empire. You see where I'm going? He's a political activist. So, you know, he really does not like Matthew. Matthew represents the Roman Empire to him. Whoa. It's kind of like church. We have Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> you know what's going on. That's going on because this is real world. This is real. These are real people. Not only do we have the, the five fishermen, we've got one guy that's noble, one guy that is a, a traitor to the Romans, we've got one guy that's a, a nationalist, he, he's a zealot, uh, but we also got a guy that's just, we call him a doubter, I just call him pessimistic, his name is Thomas, Thomas the pessimist. Just prior to this, a week before, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, but when Lazarus was sick, when, when he was sick, Jesus said, uh, finally he said, told the disciples, we're going to go see Lazarus. And, and Thomas is the one that speaks up and said, don't you know the last time we were there they tried to stone you? And, and he says, uh, yeah, but we're, we're going to go because Lazarus has died. And then Thomas says, okay, we might as well go up and die with him. So optimistic. No, no, he's a pessimist. He, he's the doubter. He's the doubter in the crowd. Then, of course, I, I left out probably the most infamous one, Judas. Judas Iscariot. What more do I need to say? He's a traitor. He's a betrayer. He's the one that, uh, it's Palm Sunday. Come Friday. Come Thursday night. Just four days on the road. He's going to sell out Jesus, kiss him on the cheek to betray him, and then afterward, he's going to realize that he, the 30 pieces of silver are all worthless. He's going to throw them in the temple because he no longer wants the money he earned for betraying him. And he's going to go out and commit suicide. He's going to go out and commit suicide. Seems to me he's a little emotionally unstable. How about you? Then there's the other two. I call them the nobodies. Because <laughs> we really don't know anything about them other than their names. They're listed in the groups. That's James the Lesser, or James uh, the Younger, and Jude, and Jude. You say, why are you going through all of this? Because I'm saying his disciples, who missed what was going on, are just like you and me. So often, we miss what God is doing. And we can look and blame them and say, why weren't you looking? Why didn't you see this when it came? Why didn't you see it when it happened? But they missed it just like you and I miss God working in our lives every single day. I want to suggest to you that Palm Sunday could be every day. Every day. Because God is at work every single day. And it's in our human frailty and it's in our human uh, sinful condition that God loves us anyway. He's picked these people to change the whole world. And only one of the bush really thinks that he can, and that's Simon the Zealot. He thinks he can take on the whole Roman Empire. We need all those kinds of people in the church. But look, folks, I just want you to notice, they missed it. Spending three years with Jesus. They didn't get it. They didn't connect the dots. And when somebody you know as a Christian isn't connecting the dots, don't be the first one to judge them. Because you're not always connecting the dots too. So we look at the people. At first, his disciples, they did not understand. They were confused. 
I got the guy here kind of leaning into the other guy's ear because I, I, I identify with being hard of hearing. <laughs> if I take my hearing aids out, it's really easy not to listen to my wife. <laughs> And she said, put those hearing aids back in. <laughs> I've got something to say to you. You say, I'm not, I, 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 I'm not deaf. I'm just hard of hearing. And you know what's really bad? With COVID, everybody's wearing a mask. When you're hard of hearing, you, you read the lips as well to help you understand what they're saying. This makes it really hard. So sometimes there's a conversation going on, and I'm not hearing it all correctly, and I'm piecing words together, and I come to the wrong conclusion. Why? Because I'm just not connecting all the dots. The disciples, it doesn't say they were hard of hearing. They were hard of understanding. They weren't quite getting. Here's Jesus teaching. He's been telling them, you know, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. They're going to crucify me, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. Why did they not get that? Why did they not understand? Why? Because sometimes we are so preoccupied with our own stuff that we don't see what God is doing. We're a little confused. We don't, uh, we're in a fog. We don't see it clearly. They were confused and did not understand all that was happening. They were living it. And they didn't understand. You know, every day I think God is active in our lives. Every day. Because he's providentially in control and he's running his universe. So every single day he's active and involved. And you know what? Sometimes we don't get it, do we? It's not because we're stupid. It's not because we're ignorant. We're just preoccupied with our own stuff that we can't see what God is doing. We need to open our eyes, and we'll see that's what happens in this passage. It says, at first the disciples did not understand, they weren't connecting all the dots, all this. What is the all this? Well, if you back up in the text, you'll read. Jesus had spent this last week of his life basically at Bethany. Don't you love that? I love that. The Lord was at Bethany. He was spending his week at Bethany with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and they were moving on this particular Sunday, the Sunday before Good Friday. They were moving to Jerusalem, and they're going to go and celebrate the Passover, and so they stop at a place called Bethpage. It's, a, it's just over the horizon, over the Mount of Olives. So it's a, a very short journey from there. Crowds have assembled. But Jesus says to the disciples, you need to go into Bethphage before he gets there. He said, run a little bit ahead of us and get me a donkey. Now that should have sent up a red flag. Hey, this must be important. He needs a donkey. Jesus would never ask us to go get a donkey. You see? And so he said, yeah, and you'll find one with a, with, with a foal. You know, the donkey's little baby foal there, but probably long, far enough to ride. If anyone stops you and asks you, what are you doing? Say, the Lord has need of him. I love that. Sometimes we'll do a a sermon on that. The Lord has need of him. If the Lord has need of an ass, he can surely use you and me. (laughs) The Lord has need of him. And, And so he comes back with the donkey. And Jesus gets on the donkey and he's riding. Now, here comes the best part. People are breaking off branches. Nobody tells them to do this. In fact, it's the wrong festival to do this. It's at the Feast of the Tabernacles in the fall, not the one in the spring, that you take the branches and you wave them and you you celebrate with branches because you're living in booths to celebrate another event that God did in past history. But here they're breaking the branches and they're taking them and they're waving them. They're throwing them down in the road. They're taking off their cloaks and they're laying them on the road. And Jesus is coming and he's trampling on them as he's going up to Jerusalem. You know what this is? This is what they do at the airports for the president. They roll out the red carpet. This is what we do at church for the bride. We roll the white runner. We're preparing for the presence of who? In this case, it is the king. Jesus is entering Jerusalem as king. 
Remember, said at this time, at the first, at the first, he's entering Jerusalem as king. The children are there. I'm sure they had their palm branches too, okay? And they might have been smacking each other with them a little bit. You know how kids do. And they're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Was Sydney not great this morning? Holy smokes. She was leading the children's choir there, singing Hosanna to the Lord, and they're all singing. The religious leaders are all upset and uptight about this. I don't think they're getting it either. The religious leaders go and they say, tell the children to stop. They don't want Jesus to be praised. And Jesus says to them, I love this verse, if they don't sing, then the stones will cry out. I kind of wish they hadn't sung so I could hear stones cry out. The stones would cry out. This had to be, you know, the disciples, when they heard that, should have said, something really big is going down here, right? No, it's right over their heads. Right over their heads. All this was going on, Jesus makes his way up into the Jerusalem, and then he cleanses the temple because they'd made the Father's house, not a house of prayer, but a house of merchandise. They were selling sacrifices, and Jesus cleanses the temple. All on Palm Sunday. The timing. Timing is important. After he was glorified, only after Jesus was glorified, timing is everything. They finally are going to get it. You know, God might be doing something in your life today. Big. Big like he was doing then. And you don't know it until much later, after he was glorified. After he was glorified. You see, it comes with hindsight. It says, only after Jesus was glorified did they realize. I take that, did they realize. Kind of like looking at the verse Romans 8.28 in the rear view mirror. You know how that works, right? I got a rear view mirror in my car, I got several of them, and it looked to see what's behind me. Most of the time when we use the verse, Romans 8, 28, we'll say to somebody, you know, the Bible says all things work together for good to those who are called, uh, uh, and, uh, <coughs> called according to his promise. Listen, all things work together for good. We're talking, you're in a difficult time right now, but God's going to work that out in the future for good. You just wait and see. He's not saying, hey, this, something good's going to happen out of this. This verse is saying, I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and I look behind me, and I say, oh my goodness, look what God did, and I missed it. He worked everything together for good, and I missed it. I didn't understand it. That's what I'm saying. Today is Palm Sunday. He is still King Jesus. He's still working everything together for good, and he has... But we need to take time and reflect back and see what God has done. Most of us can do that. Most of us can look back in time and see that God has done something really incredible in my life, and I just didn't get it at that time. Here's a real simple one. When I look back to my eight-year-old life experience, child, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, okay? At the time, I didn't think that was such a big deal. Kind of like the disciples here. They were disciples, followers of Jesus, and, and something's going down, and yeah, they're, they're involved in it. They're caught up in the celebration and the hype, and, and I got saved, and I went and bought a postcard and wrote back to my mom that I'd gotten saved. And, and, uh, but when I look back, you see, as an eight-year-old boy, you know why I got saved? The preacher preached on heaven and hell. The option of hell was not very desirable to me. So I accepted Jesus as an insurance policy that I would not go to hell. <laughs> you getting the picture here? I did not, I didn't because, oh, Jesus loved me. No, 
I, I didn't like the prospect of burning forever and ever and ever in hell, okay? And so I accepted Jesus. Now when I look back, I say, oh my goodness, you missed everything. Jesus loved me. He died for me. He took my sin. I, and he told me all that, but that's, that wasn't my motivator. And, and then I, as I grow in my, my grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I see I missed that he chose me. I didn't really choose him. He chose me. He pardoned me. He forgave me of all my sins. And when I start calculating, he justified me. Listen, all these, he sanctified me, set me apart as special. And I start going, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell me. He changed my life from inside out. And I look back in that rear view mirror and I say, whoa, I missed all that stuff. Because I was only focused on one thing. I wanted to be eternally secure in heaven with Jesus. And believe me, that was good. Because the other option is not good at all. Every day, though, there are things in our lives. God is working in your life. In your life. He was working in all 12 disciples' lives. He's working in your life. But with hindsight, later we see it because we're just like them. We're too preoccupied with the things to notice what he is doing at the moment. Wow. They were in the fog. What do you do when you're in the fog? You turn on your fog lights. They were in the fog, and they needed to turn on the fog lights. It says, <clears throat> they remember these things, okay, that they had been written about him. They realize all that, that they had been written about him. Oh, later they're reading in the Word of God, and they come across a passage like this. This is one of those fog light passages. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, daughters of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous, having salvation, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of the donkey. They say, whoa, look at this. Hey, guys, did you see this? How did I miss this? You know how many times I was at Torah school and I was, you know, and they were going through the, the, the Sabbath day Sunday or the Sabbath lesson, the Sabbath day school lesson, and, and they went through Zechariah and uh, how did I miss this? I've come to the conclusion that there is a verse for everything that's going on in your life. You just haven't discovered it yet. Hmm. There is a verse for everything going on in your life. You haven't discovered it yet. Somewhere along the line, Zechariah pops into their, their mind or they're at, at a, a service and the speaker brings that verse to bear and they say all of a sudden, whoa, hey, do you remember when we went, you know, from Bethphage down into Jerusalem, everybody had the palm branches and remember when Jesus said, hey, go get the donkey? And when we went and got him, he rode on him. Uh, hey, you guys, you think maybe that was what's going on here in Zechariah? <laughs> A little connecting of the dots. Whoa. Whoa. Or how about this one? Maybe they're reading in the psalm. Oh, Lord, save us. That's the word Hosanna. Hosanna. Oh, Lord. Grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Isn't that exactly what they were shouting on that Palm Sunday? I said, whoa, what's going on here? You see, the fog lights are on and it's starting to clear out what, what they missed because now they can see that God was actually fulfilling scriptures. He said, from the house of the Lord, we will bless you. Or how about this one? It's found also in Psalm chapter 8. It says, From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemy to silence the foe and the avenger. <laughs> That's exactly, the, the foes were trying to get the children to shut up. And he said, if they were to shut up, the stones would cry out. They were in the fog. So they turned the fog lights on. I'm suggesting when you're at a situation in your life, maybe you've got anxiety and worry, or maybe it's fear, or maybe 
uh, it could be anything, a physical ailment or something, and you say, uh, boy, I, I sure wish I had a verse for that. I, I'm going to tell you a little cheater system of finding that verse. Just Google it. If you don't use Google, use Bing. Bing it. Just type in there, I'm worried. I need a Bible verse. Somebody's got something out there with a list of them, 10, 20 verses. Whoa. And then you start reading them. And you find that one where the Spirit of God says, boom. You see, I'm at work every single day. I'm running controlling. I'm providentially in control. And I had you land on that verse so that the Word of God will speak to your life. Whoa. You can do it for any topic. As a preacher, I do it all the time. I, in fact, you can put in there, give me a sermon on anxiety. Boop, it'll pop up. You can do that too. And you can find, or you just open up your Bible. You got to be careful with that, though. You don't say things like, okay, Lord, um, show me your will today. I'm just going to crack it open. And uh, Judas went out and hung himself. Oh, no, no, no. Flip my Bible. Boom. Oh, go do thou likewise. Oh, no. What thou dost do quickly. No. That is not the way. You read the whole context and you say, God, speak to me. Speak to me. To address my daily need. My daily need. God, I don't want to miss what you're doing. This was a great thing that he was doing. Jesus was being presented as king, offering himself as king, riding on the donkey, and offering himself as salvation. They go hand in hand. The king would have been a great celebration. They gave the, the, the royal red carpet treatment with the palm leaves and the cloaks, and he was approaching, and they rejected him as king. And then you guess what? On Good Friday, he dies. They've gone, they should have gone from this high celebration to the low, but guess what? There are biblical prophecies in all of it. And they are all going to be fulfilled. Going to be fulfilled. And they, and that they had done these things to him. They did exactly what the scripture said, both on Palm Sunday as you're entering as king and on Good Friday when they were crucifying the Lord of glory. Both in the highs and the lows of your life, God, God has a word for you. It's in his word. And no matter where you're at, use the cheater. Google it, bing it, find it. Get into the Bible and see what he's got to say to you. The fulfillment. Just a little bit earlier in John chapter 10, he said the scripture cannot be broken. You realize that? The Bible cannot be broken. It is going to happen just as he laid it out. In another place in Matthew chapter 5, he said, I am not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. That's what's going on. Jesus is fulfilling the Word of God. If we know the Word of God, we will see it unfolding and Him fulfilling it. He goes on to say, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle, I'm using Old King James Version, one jot or tittle will pass away until all is fulfilled. The, the jot is a yod. It's a little letter. It's the smallest letter in, in Hebrew. It's just a little tiny curly Q. It's kind of like our apostrophe. That's what it looks like, an apostrophe. A tittle is the overhang of the letter. Like if you're looking at Roman uh, font, every letter's got little, little serifs that come off of them. That little serif would have been called the tittle. You see, not one yod, not one little tiny tittle is going to pass until all is fulfilled. Listen, you have a more sure word of prophecy than anything else in your Bible. And God is speaking still to this day through his word. You know what? They missed it because they didn't know it. 
I wonder what I'm missing today because I don't know it. Wow. See, that, that brings me to the application. This story is in the Bible, but it wasn't written for Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It wasn't written for Philip. It wasn't Andrew. Just go down the list of disciples. It wasn't written for them. They lived it. It was written for you and me. Wow. It was written for you and me. So when I get into the Bible, I start to see what God is doing in my life and in my world. I wonder what I'm missing the day I'm not in my Bible. I find this so fascinating. We have some daily bread scattered around in the church here, and we have the secret place from time to time, and they're daily devotionals. Do you realize these daily devotionals are written probably a good six months to nine months, maybe a year in advance? And when you open that page and you read that, and you read the verse, and then you read the little devotional thought, usually a little prayer at the bottom, and you say, oh my goodness, how did they know I needed that today? It's all providential. God was planning months ahead so that when you cracked that open, he'd speak to you. He'd speak to you. I think every Sunday could be Palm Sunday. Every day could be Palm Sunday. Because God is at work every day. I'm too often, because I'm just like the disciples, I'm missing too much. Because I'm not applying and searching for, what are you doing, God, in my life? And so what I need to do is apply it. God gave the whole Bible to the Jews. Zechariah, those promises. The Psalms, those promises. He gave it all, all to them. And he came unto his own, John 1, chapter 11. Or John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own. He came to the Jewish community. And his own received him not. On Good Friday, they said, same crowd saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Well, a different crowd. They're on Good Friday saying, crucify him, crucify him. He presented himself as king on Palm Sunday. On Friday, we will not have this man to rule over us. Whoa, we are so fickle. If it doesn't go my way, hit the highway. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to all who received him and welcomed him and saw him in all these circumstances going on, in all the ups and downs of my life, to all who received him, to them he gave the authority to be the children of God. You're in the family. <laughs> He's King Jesus. He's King Jesus. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. He's your King. The application that I really want for us today is to say, hey, on this Palm Sunday, Jesus, I want you to be my king. My king. My Lord, my Savior, my king. Rule. I will submit to you, O Lord. Be King Jesus to me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, We've, we've just looked at this one verse and tried to unpack it. It says, when he was glorified, they understood. He told the disciples that uh, just a few late verses later, my hour for glorification has come. Then he went to the cross. He died for us. He was buried. He rose again. In that resurrected state, he is glorified. We worship and serve the glorified Savior. And Lord, we pray that as, your, as our glorified Savior, you would be our King. That we would yield our hearts to you. We'd bend our knee. Say, Lord, whatever you will, I will do. Give me that willing heart. Open my eyes to what you're doing in my life right now. Help me find the scriptures to interpret what you're doing in my life, O oh Lord. I want a real living relationship with you, O oh Lord. I am, Lord, a little ignorant, but I'm not totally stupid. I misunderstood some things, but 
I'm not dumb. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I might see. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.